several partnerships to come in the near future where we provide the space and platform to our audience and our community to be a part of these important conversations. So today's topic is the importance of media in a free and democratic society. And I'd like to expand that title and not just media, but also let's talk about the press. Uh, we have a really distinguished panel, as I mentioned before, of current Cronkite students, recent alums, and also Barrett, and also our esteemed faculty members. So with that, I wanna explain that we're going to have a conversation for about the first half of this session. And then after that, you, our audience, will have the opportunity to ask questions or share your thoughts. And we will address those in the second half of the session. For now, I'd like to turn it over to our panelists and let themselves say hello and introduce themselves. So in no particular order, who would like to go first? Sure, I'll go first. I'm not sure I am in the, the Welcome and thank you to my esteemed colleagues that were on the panel with me. My name is Vanita Hawthorne James. I am a professor in Cronkite News at the Cronkite School. I oversee reporters in social justice and money currently in the Sports Bureau. And I am also co-chair of the downtown co-chair of the Center of the, of the Committee for Campus Inclusion, CCI. And thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Vanita. I'll pick up where she left off. Hi, my name is Lillian I'm Donahue. I'm a reporter out in Charleston, beautiful Charleston, South Carolina. Um, but before I was out here, I graduated from the Cronkite School of Journalism um, just a little bit over a year ago. Um, worked with um, the wonderful Borderlands team, um, did a lot of bilingual border reporting as well as um, Indian country reporting and worked in the DC Bureau and um, all over the country. So this is a, a different jump for me, but I've been a reporter here out at a local station affiliate um, here in Charleston. So I'm really excited to have this conversation with y'all. Thanks, Lillian. Uh, I can go next. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Colton Schoen. I am not a recent graduate of Cronkite. It's been, it's been a minute. I graduated in 2011. I did the uh, joint bachelor's and master's program. So I uh, was part of the uh, Barrett Honors College. And when I was a student, my uh, project was a documentary that explored the uh, low representation of Native Americans in television news. And that's always been a passion of mine because I am uh, an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation. My, my parents are both Navajo, I'm Navajo. I was raised in Phoenix, but they're both from the reservation. And one of the things that I had noticed growing up was there weren't many people who looked like me on television um, reporting on stories with Indian country. So I made it my mission to do that. Um, ever since I graduated from Cronkite School, I've been a radio reporter, I've been a television reporter, I've done documentaries as well. Um, worked as a reporter for CBS 5 in Phoenix and then anchored in Tucson. And then now I'm here in Albuquerque, New Mexico as the morning anchor for the NBC station. And every single station or publication that I've contributed to, I've always made a point to find the Native American stories that are not being told. Um, we can discuss more of this later what kind of actual stories I've done, but that's been a huge, um, that's been a huge issue for me to make sure that uh, the, the voice of an underrepresented community is told in the mainstream. Excellent, Colton. And certainly we look forward to touching upon that a little bit later. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'll pick up from there. My name is Mary Louise Long. I'm the president of public, the Public Relations Student Society of America at ASU. I'm also a first generation college student. So being at ASU is something that um, for at least for me, it was always a goal and being in the Barrett Honors College too as well, just kind of solidified everything that I've been doing. So I have a lot of family watching, so I know they're pretty proud of me. So I just had to say hello. Um, and other than that, I have been in the Cronkite School since May or since August of 2018. I'll graduate in, the tw in May of 2021 and I'm starting my master's this semester too. So it's an exciting year. Excellent. We're so happy you're here, Mary. Welcome. Thank you. I'll go ahead and pick up from there. Um, my name is Rafael Romero Ruiz. I am a junior at uh, the Walter Cronkite School and also the college. I am a Barrett Honors student. Um, I'm double majoring in journalism as well as the transborder studies um, with the focus on media and expressive culture. Um, and I'm also minoring in digital audiences. 
Um, I'm a Chicano. I'm also reconnecting to Ramuri and Yoem. Um, those are two tribes here in the Southwest. Um, and yeah, I'm also the co-president of the Multicultural Student Journalist Coalition that was just set up. Um, so yeah, very excited to be here. Wonderful, Rafael, thank you. Um, okay, I'll go now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nicole Shin. I'm the vice president of the National Association of Black Journalists here at ASU. Um, I'm also a Barrett, the Honors College student, and I'm a rising junior at Cronkite. Um, co-siding with Rafa. I'm also a co-president of the Multi Multicultural Student Journalist Coalition, and I'm pretty sure that's it. But yeah, thank you for having me here. I'm really excited for this conversation. That's it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that, sounds like, that, that sounds like a lot. So thank you, Nicole, for joining us. Like I said, I, I truly love to see everybody on this panel. I think we come from so many different perspectives, um, and especially when it comes to journalism, that is one of the key components that we're going to be discussing, right? The importance of being able to not only see diversity, but how do you implement diversity in our coverage? You know, myself, I'm also a first generation. I'm Latina. I'm the daughter of immigrants. So a lot of these themes also hit very close to home. So the main umbrella topic here is the importance of media and the press. But as I mentioned, I think it's important that we try to define and separate media and the free press, right? We hear so much about the media nowadays, everywhere, on the headlines, on Twitter, on Facebook. But media is sort of like the encompassing of all of these things, television, radio, online, pod, I mean, we could just go on and on and on. The free press, free press sort of has a much more defined focus, which is, if you wanna say it in, in a way, kind of more of a journalism focus. I would love for our panelists to tackle this question because let's just address the reality. It is not an easy time to be a journalist in 2020, right? We're dealing with so many things at the same time. We're dealing with um, you know, the demonstrations that are happening across the nation in terms of social movements, not just happening out in the streets, but in newsrooms all across the country, a reckoning, if you will, of this topic and theme of diversity and inclusion that has been there for a long time, but now has really been pushed to the forefront of the conversation. Um, you add coronavirus and how do we go out there and cover that in a, in a healthy and safe way? And of course you also throw in the attacks against the press, right? Fake news, et cetera. So again, if you didn't know, it's not the easiest time to be a journalist in 2020, um, or a communicator or a content creator, right? So I'd like to hear from our panelists, despite these challenges, many of you are out there either already in the field, in the studios, on the streets, working, or actually still in school to get your degree, to go out there. Why do you think, why do you think despite these challenges, it's still important for us to make sure that we maintain a free press in order to maintain a democratic society? I know it's a big question, but we're all doing it, right? And that's what I always tell the people I work with. I wouldn't do this work if I wasn't passionate about it. And if I didn't see the value and the necessity of this kind of work. So I would love to hear from your perspective, particularly because many of you um, are considerably younger than I am. And so share your thoughts and why you think it's important and why you do what you do. Um, I can go ahead and take it. Um, so I think that there's a major responsibility on all of us. Um, I think even now expanding the definition of press, I think anybody can be a member of the press now. Um, just because anybody can start a blog, anybody can start documenting what's going on in their neighborhoods. I think that's kind of how I started. Um, so I come from a low income community here in, on the south side of Tucson. And a lot of us here are often left voiceless. Um, we don't really have a say on what's going on around us, whether it's, you know, through gentrification or through uh, having lead in our water. So having, you know, an outlet for us to speak on these issues, to, to go ahead and, and provide the folks that live in these neighborhoods a voice to, to, you know, talk to people 
and present it to elected officials, I think is super important. And I think now, as we see demonstrations all along the country and even internationally, I think we're seeing how it is that, you know, being a person who is giving out information to folks is dangerous. You know, we have members of the press who have been attacked by the police themselves. You know, we got folks getting tear gas when they're just trying to take pictures of what's going on. Um, and this isn't, you know, this isn't new. This is what's been happening. We've had this happen before. You know, we hear stories about what happened during the Watts riots in, in Los Angeles and how it is that members of the press there were treated or even, you know, as a member of uh, NHJ, we always hear about how it is the Chicano moratorium was tear gassed and, you know, we had members there who got killed, you know, and I think right now members of the press have a huge target on their back, but they also have the biggest job to do and that's to keep folks, you know, informed and, and for people to understand what's going on around them and making sure that the misinformation around them is also, you know, like died down so that way people can actually have opinions that are, are informed and, and have responsible takes on the world around us. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I almost feel like the, the importance of it being a free press and media, it almost is that surefire checks and balance on the politicians and everything. Like I think you can take Governor Ducey's talk last week and those journalists just really drilling him. Like we got a lot of answers that we weren't gonna get unless they had those questions at the end. And it's just, it almost just like solidifies the information that we see popping up on Twitter every day. And when you see it on 12 news or in the paper, it's like, okay, it's not just some teenager saying it. Like we all need to pay attention and listen. So I'll um, jump in real quick. Um, you know, a huge reason why I became a journalist. I um, mean, actually I would say the catalyst in my decision to get into media. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, which um, for those who don't know the context of St. Louis, Missouri, it's a very diverse um, area, but unfortunately it's a, a diverse area that is highly separated via socioeconomic status. Um, and, and with that, there's, there's race separation as well um, in the city. And back um, while I was in high school, Ferguson happened, the Ferguson conflict. Um, and when I I remember I was working for, I was already working for an education station there and I was just reading, following along with national press and things that I kept hearing. And I was honestly appalled. <laughs> and, 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 but that's, but that's because, right. That was one of the first few times in our modern era. Now that this 24 hour news cycle, that this constant desire and feed for information was directly clashing with this um, extremely different social unrest that we are, have now been seeing for the past six years, I truly think since Ferguson. So um, I went out, grabbed a camera. I did a full on, you know, five, six minute piece that aired across St. Louis about how ma media mass interpretation, okay, um, can sometimes harm communities um, just as much as it can help it. And I decided, you know what, it's time to, I'm going to get into the press. I'm going to become a journalist. Um, and in that, I want to expose the good things I also want to bring to light um, aspects and put things into context when they're happening. Um, and I want to be that journalist that covers those big breaking, um, you know, things that are going to go in our history books 50 years from now. But I want to do that, that helps the community move forward rather than further divides a community. And that's really when I became a journalist. I was like, all right, I'm not stopping. And that's really kind of what drove me through when I was doing border reporting, um, you know, okay, where are the marginalized communities? How rather through my reporting, rather than separating, how can I bring people together against a common cause or with a common cause or some with my reporting um, show objectivity, but also shine light on these issues. And so since I've been here in South Carolina, um, uh, Again, I'm all about history, I'm all about context, and I'm all about understanding the communities that you're reporting in to accurately represent it. Um, it really came full circle with the riots here in Charleston. And when I was reporting here, um, you know, there was gunshots behind my live shot. Um, I was tear gassed out of one of my live shots. Um, and I just remember thinking, wow, this is, this is six years later from Ferguson, we're having the same conversation. How can I turn this into a moment for our city um, to not just educate people safely, don't come downtown right now um, live, 
but also keep composure. And, and the third, really important, I say the most important thing that we can do is create that context and say, here is that context of why this is happening. You answer the question why, and you go that second, third, fourth, as much as it's more work, you dig a little bit deeper than that breaking news story. And that's when you hit the gold of this kind of reporting. And that's truly, I think us as reporters, we have to hold ourselves to that higher standard. It might be a longer work day. It might be more research and more work, um, even in the field with riots, um, you know, going that extra level and saying, how let's talk. Stay, how do you stay? And this is a, a question for the other panelists as well. I mean, Lillian, you just described some of the challenges that many reporters and, 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 you know, journalists at large are facing nowadays. My question is, how, how do you stay resilient in the face of that? Um, you know, I will tell you that, I don't wanna say back in my day, because I don't think I'm that old, but back in my day, you know, the term mental care, self-care, mental health, that didn't exist. Um, at least in, in, in the newsrooms that I worked in. It was a, it was a matter of, this is what you chose, this is how it is, and you got to deal with it. Um, and if you don't like it, there's a long line of people waiting to get in. Thankfully, I do think now we're having more of those conversations surrounding the importance of self-care. But I'm curious to know, how do you all stay resilient in the face of so much, sometimes adversity and challenges, um, something that you feel so passionate about, but unfortunately we're living in a time where many people out there are discrediting the profession almost every single day. For me, it's my faith. I just, that's flat out, it's, it's my faith. Um, it's also taking a minute to just remind myself I have a calling and I'm gonna continue to live that calling um, as a reporter, so hand it away. Sorry, Colton, you were about to say something. Yeah, so what I was gonna say was for me, I know it can be a really lot to unpack. Uh, as the morning anchor for uh, the market here, we are reading stories about what's going on in the world all the time for two and a half hours, five days a week. So it's it's always good to just take a deep breath after you're done with the show. You know, sometimes for me, I'll just go running a coffee and just kind of decompress. But one of the things that kind of gets me through all this stuff that's going on right now is um, the results. Obviously, we see the initial reaction or the initial response to an event. And for instance, coronavirus, um, you know, specifically for the Navajo Nation. Uh, just a few weeks ago, you guys may remember that uh, the Navajo Nation was the number one hotspot for coronavirus in the country. And during that time, you had all the national media outlets doing their live shots in Navajo country. And, you know, they're still facing an issue right now, but those national cameras are gone. So this is where I think local media is really important because we are there to keep following the story to see what is going to happen. And for me, just to kind of like know that I'm making a difference in my reporting is spotlighting these stories and also seeing that there is something happening. There is movement happening. Uh, the CARES Act, for instance, uh, tribes got billions of dollars to uh, deal with some of the systemic problems that uh, Native American tribes have been facing for, for centuries. Uh, for instance, uh, electrification and running water in homes is something that uh, is still pretty few and far between on some of the tribal lands, especially the Navajo Nation. And so finding out just a few weeks ago that a huge chunk of that money is going to be going towards the, the electrification and infrastructure for water for a lot of residents there to hopefully prevent a second wave of the uh, of the coronavirus on the nation is what kind of keeps me like pushing forward let's see what else is going to happen for these communities uh, what is not going to happen so that we can hold these government leaders accountable for it. so the developments. Yeah, at the onset, sometimes you're like, oh my gosh, what is going on in this world today? But then you see a lot of changes being made and you know, you're know, you there to help write history. I like that. Let me go. I like that you, well, Colton, she's talking about solutions. And I think the solutions are multiple. They're, they're in the coverage that we do and the kind of stories we pursue and the way that we pursue them as well. I also think there's respite and resilience in of things like organizations like uh, Raphael and the co-reference the Multicultural Student Journals Associations. They bring in that, they and others are bringing that group together to solve and deal with issues that need to be 
done. I, th I think joining organizations like that one help keep you focused on solutions, but also they're like a tall, they're like a big tall glass of water that you drink when you're really thirsty to get people and you really need them. And, and you didn't know how thirsty you were until you have them. But I also think as someone, I can say that uh, clearly that I'm probably the one that's been in the profession the longest, just looking at this screen right now. And I would tell you that there, it's not just about that this week or last week, it is over time you feel like, uh, sometimes like Fannie Lou Hamer said, she said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Of course, she didn't lay down because of that. She just said, I'm doing something about it. But there are times when you just need to take a step back and uh, just take time for yourself. There are some times when you want someone's going to ask you questions and you're going to be willing to educate them. At the times when you say like, you know, I'm not using my personal story to educate you. You're going to have to deal with that yourself. I'm not taking my trauma. So I think there's a, there are different layers of solutions in terms of resilience. Rest, doing the work, as, as uh, you spoke about, joining organizations that recognize who you are and can and be that respite for you and then just plan just taking a break sometime and then getting back in the battle. How do you take a break from Twitter? I, I, asking for a friend. Yes. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Nicole, go ahead. Oh, no, I... Who else, though? Nicole, I think. Is, yeah, thank you. I was just going to speak to, like, the social media aspect, especially regarding everything that we've seen transpiring over, like, the last five weeks, five, six weeks or so. A lot of it has been social media activism that's, like, continuously you're just drowning in everything that's happening. And it's, like, every day. I'm not even, like, that active on Twitter. I check it, but then like I go to Instagram and it's just like, there's so much happening at a time and I don't know how to digest it. And the reason I got into journalism is because I wanna make documentaries. Like I wanna do long form pieces. You have to take your time with those. And I know it's kind of conflicting to the fact that news is all about like timeliness. And a lot of the times, like I can't speak as much for field reporting because I haven't done a lot of that, but just in my last two years at the Cronkite School, it's an extremely competitive environment and it seems like you have to be the first one to get your story out or else somebody else is going to like take your idea and that's not what the industry should be about i liked what lillian said about like know the history know the people that you're covering know that the story is more relevant than you got this story out before another anchor or so was able to do it but that you took the time so i mean for social media while the activism on that front is incredibly important journalism is not necessarily activism but in the sense of being resilient, you need to be able to space it out because this time, like the change doesn't happen immediately. You can't just do all of your activism in 24 hours and solve all of the world's issues. If you don't give yourself a break, you'll burn out. And then who is there to solve the problem? Who is there to tell the stories if you've worked yourself up so much that you can't even think about this stuff without having a mental breakdown? So for Twitter, just delete the app, like delete it for 24 <laughs> hours, do not touch it. I just delete it. <laughs> Don't look at it for a little bit and then come back after you've taken the time for yourself to rebuild the energy to do what you need to do. So I totally like agree with you, Nicole. I feel like the whole having to be first takes away so much of the quality of news. Like, I think that's where we get a lot of our backlash in our industry is people are saying like, oh, I just read this article it has so many typos in it. Or it's just like, like, what is this? Like, and it's like, okay, well, they found it from this person who said it first. And then it just trickled down. It's just like playing telephone. If you're not the first person to find it, write it and put it out there. Like you're, it, it isn't always going to be the highest quality. Oh. And I think when you're looking on social media, you're seeing every single person's opinion about something that's going on. And at least for me, I like to digest it that way so that I can like have a very broad, I don't know, understanding and opinion of things. But it, it definitely does get overwhelming when you find out that there was another shooting or another, like another person has died. And it's like, okay, Twitter, like I, it's too much. Like you wake up and you're like, I can't look at this right now. So you just have to like, set aside the time to say, okay, this is when I'm going to get super informed and look at all this stuff. And then this is a time where I'm going to have my own thoughts about it rather than constantly getting thrown information at my direction. Well, Mary and Nicole are saying no. basically, sorry. <laughs> no, I just had a quick Mary. message for students and for people who haven't graduated yet or haven't 
worked in the field yet, um, you know, it's always okay um, to remind yourself that you're a human. Yes, you're a journalist and you have to hold yourself to those standards, but you're a human being. And if you need to take a second and listen to a song in the car or deep breathe for a minute, like do it for your mental health as a reporter. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes if you do a lot Facebook live and there's 200,000 people watching like yesterday on my Facebook live, you have to remind yourself, all right, everything I said on that was completely accurate because I'm an accurate reporter. I cannot spend my day looking at the 2000 comments, you know, after that, because that is that kind of social media thing that we're talking about. So for those who haven't graduated yet, for those students, remind yourself it doesn't end when you graduate. It doesn't end when you get that first job in the market um, or if you get that internship. Um, it's a continuous work in process and that's okay. Thanks, Lillian. Sorry, Vanita, go ahead. No, I was saying what, what Mary and Nicole and what other that is basically are saying like, if you're, I always like to say it and I've heard others say it, that you're first, but you're not, fir you're not first if you're not right. You're not first if you're not excellent. And they're talking about, and I'm really happy to hear you talking about excellence and quality is Trump's things just regurgitated out there just to say that you're first, that's not first. Yeah, Vanita brings up a very good point. One thing that I always try to remind myself is, you know, pursue excellence in my work, not pursue the validation of others. Um, because you can get very lost in that very quickly. Uh, but if you just focus on making sure that your work is, again, as excellent as possible, I find that that more often than not leads to success, whatever that success may look for each and every one of us. S some of you have brought up an interesting um, sub-conversation, which is the topic of journalism slash activism. And that's a really hot topic right now. Um, I hear it amongst many of our students. Um, many of our students have a lot of feelings and thoughts about this topic, which I completely understand. I mean, it's hard not to when you see so many things happening around you that you feel passionate about, that you want to get involved because you want to take a stand. You know, some people say that journalism at its core in some ways is a form of activism onto itself. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts in terms of, of this particular topic, because this is something that actually we're having a lot of conversations at the Cronkite School about. As you all know, um, for many, many years, the school has been very, pretty hard line when it comes to maintaining objectivity, ma making sure that you're not biased in your coverage. But I do think that it's important to acknowledge that social media and just the times that we are living in demand a conversation about potential changes or adjustments to that. What do you think about that? How do you handle or how do you straddle that fine line between maintaining your objectivity as a journalist, but also at the same time um, being a participant in a lot of these social movements that we're seeing. Yeah, so, um, I can go ahead and take a hit on this real quick. Um, I am definitely one of those students who have a lot of opinions and a lot to say surrounding this topic. Um, I think, you know, arguably that's one of the reasons why Nicole and I and the rest of the team, as along with Manita, have started the, the coalition. Um, and I think, you know, there's something to say about journalism and activism because I view journalism as a tool. I think that it is something that is in my kit in order to create change. Um, you know, for a lot of people, activism looks like something that you can step in and then get out real quick. For a lot of us, you know, existing is just activism all on its own, you know, breaking down barriers, whether it be in your career or whatever other interests you have, I think is a form of activism as well. Um, and I think, you know, when you come from a disenfranchised community, you know, you can't help but to put that into your writing. You can't help but to have those experiences play a part of the photos that you're taking or whatever subjects you're doing because it's so ingrained in you just as though, you know, whatever favorite food you have is, you know, it's just, it becomes a part of you because of your experiences and, and what you have learned from either in the classroom or if you've been followed in a supermarket or if you've been a victim of police brutality yourself. I think these are all things that play a part in the way that you shape your perspective in your work. And so I think that you're right. And at its core, I think journalism is a form of activism. 
the reason I view it as a tool is because it helps me tell the stories of the people that I live around, you know, like these are people who don't have access to a very good education. I think that I consider myself very privileged to come from this neighborhood and then make it all the way up to college. You know, that's not something that happens a lot in my neighborhood. There was actually a drive-by shooting like two weeks ago, like two streets down. And this is just the reality that I, I and many other of my colleagues live in. And so when it comes to, you know, objectivity, how am I gonna be asked to be objective and what definition that means when I have existed my whole entire life as the person I am and not whatever framework objectivity is, you know? Thank you, Raphael, for sharing that. Nicole? Um, I just wanted to kind of piggyback off of what Rafa is saying. I, the, the first question that you asked about the importance of a free press in a democratic society, first thing that popped up was what we learned in 110. I don't remember when, like I think the first semester, but Dean Gilger said that um, the press is a pillar of democracy and without the free press, you don't have democracy. And at the same time, without activism, without people calling for social change, without people who are reserving the right to demand this society that they live in to change for the better, you don't have democracy. So I think if you look at it from that perspective, journalism, I would completely agree with Rafa, is one aspect of the whole wheel that is um, activism. And also NABJ a couple of weeks ago had a huge discussion about objectivity following um, George Floyd and then consequently the protests after that and how that was covered. And that just like Rafa said, it's unfair to ask a journalist, specifically, a, I would say a journalist of color, to go into this issue and then can be objective because I think it's kind of hard to say, well, what is objectivity? Because objectively, police brutality is wrong. Objectively, murdering someone for the color of their skin is wrong. So how am I going to go and report on this and not blatantly call out this police department is racist? Why does that you're going to offend people no matter what you say. And I think that the reason many Cronkite students have been very vocal about this is because it seems more so that the discussion of objectivity is not wanting to offend people as opposed to whether or not you're doing good journalism. Because I felt that the good journalism was calling out what is wrong that we haven't been looking at. They're saying, hey, pay attention to this. I need you to see it because you are the ones that have a voice for change. That's how journalism and activism and free press play into democratic systems. That was a lot. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it just absolutely does, Nicole. I see a lot of emphatic head nodding. I was wondering if, if Colton or, or Mary had um, anything that they wanted to add. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this is something that uh, I've been thinking a lot about lately um, when it comes to this, uh, this panel. And you know, I've been doing this out in the field uh, 12 years now, so it feels like a lifetime for me for all of the countless stories that I've told and every single story that I tell, I try to always go at it objectively. You know, I want to do both sides of the story. I want to talk to uh, people, what they think about certain issues so that they both, you know, have their, their opinions told because I, I got into this. Um, wanting to be that objective journalist who wants to tell things are like how they are. Um, obviously, the 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 way people you know perceive my report sometimes uh, they'll say one thing over the other. You know, so if I get both sides angry at me for a story that I did, I feel like I had somewhat done my job a little bit. Um, you know, like when it comes to how things are right now, like. You're not going to find me posting my my thoughts about certain issues on Twitter or or, or face, Facebook or anything like that. You know, I want to be that tried and true journalist that when someone turns on Channel Four at four thirty in the morning, they know that I'm going to do my hardest to make sure that I, I present things objectively. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, Colton. Yes. I mean, I have my experiences too. Obviously, we all do have our experiences, and I think that when we talk about stories in the editorial meeting. Uh, that's when I'm like, well, you know, this is this is the way this certain thing is taken for 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 some communities or something like that, you know, because you know, like uh, like uh, Raphael, you know, I, I grew up in inner city also, you know, uh, single parent household, and and sometimes when I see stories or like when I'm the only person of color in a newsroom, not many people have that experience that I do, you know, so telling them about myself or kind of bringing another perspective is, is, uh, is what I try to do. 
Yeah. So, I mean, I am not in the traditional journalism field. I'm working in PR. I currently have an internship at an agency. And so for me, where like this sense of objectivity and stating my opinion, like when it can, can't, it really comes in in like client meetings when they suggest something and I'm like, I wouldn't say that, or I wouldn't use that term, or that doesn't sound good. And like, even as an intern, like it, in the first couple of weeks, it was hard because I was like, okay, I want everybody to like me and I want a job and this is kind of hard. But at the same time, it's like, I don't think that that's a good idea. Here's something that I think we could do on social. And honestly, it took a lot to like, suggest even suggest like hey it's blackout tuesday maybe we should post a black like a black picture on our instagram and like to me i'm thinking like that's like the bare minimum but for some for the client it's like i don't know if we want to like get into that and so it's like it's it's very it's a very different conversation than i think the one that we're having right now but it kind of says the same thing of like i don't necessarily want everyone to think not know my opinions like i want people to know that this is how I feel about this and you can't just say that around me and me not say anything so it for me that's kind of where it comes in I I, similar to Nicole I don't have a whole lot of experience in field reporting so I or reporting in general Um, but in storytelling like I think it's really important to express reality regardless of how it's going to affect the readers well Mary I mean it is, it is connected actually. Um, and, mm-hmm. and, and just Nicole, total circle back. Uh, we still need long form documentary uh, more than ever. So that's important. Mm-hmm. I want you to know that. I've been meaning to tell you that. Um, but Mary, you bring up a really good point. And that is that not just in journalism, but in the PR field, in fields that entail communication, right? Engaging with an audience, digital audiences, et cetera. You know, it, there's so much to unpack there because one, I look around this panel and I see the value that each and every single one of you brings to the profession, whatever arm of the profession you decide you wanna go down on because of your personal lived experiences, right? Mm -hmm. That informs who you are and your perspectives. And like you said, Mary, you went into that client meeting saying, I think we need to do something about this. Um, one, that's not easy to do, right? Mm-hmm. That takes courage. Vanita and I talk about this all the time with our students, you know, building and flexing that muscle is not easy because you don't want to be that person, right? Yeah. That always raises his or her hand. And at the same time, you don't want to be tokenized, right? You, you don't want to be that go-to, like I can't speak for the entirety of the Latino population. Um, mm-hmm. But these are some of the responsibilities and the weight that we have to carry. So that, um, that's a long way of me wanting to get to this question, which is how do you use your background and your lived experiences and, and, and your diversity? How do you use that to inform the reporting or the content creation or the kind of campaigns that you create? I think it has a lot, oh, sorry. Go ahead, <laughs> I think Mary. it has a lot. Um, I think it has a lot to do with framing. So like, obviously a lot of what I do all day is pitching. And if I can get a reporter or a publication to see the more divert, like the side of the story that isn't being told because it is like, they're getting tons and tons of emails a day. So it, it, it goes into a lot of things, but at the heart of it, it's like, okay, this is this person, this is their story and this is why it's important and special. And recently we did um, a story for, Uh, flag cleaning for prestige cleaners and instead of taking the like hey it's fourth of july it's flag day whatever um angle take the okay our flag and our country is under a lot of scrutiny right now and it just kind of feels a little dirty in my opinion to to be represented by this image and so how can you clean it up well Physically, you can get your flag cleaned, but moving forward from there, here's how you can educate yourself and these are the things that you can do. And like, you can, you can take really simple things and connect it back to the important political topics that some people maybe just aren't paying attention to. I think a lot of it is just redirecting people's attention and informing them on things that they may not have access to in regular media consumption. Leadership, in other words. I'm going to actually answer a question that's also in the chat from someone on, on objectivity about uh, blind spots. You want to read that question, Benita? The question is, 
how can you guarantee objectivity? Is there a concern with quote unquote bias, blind spots? If so, how do you solve this while keeping the integrity of the story? And others can think about that too in a minute, but I just want to sort of circle back to that because to me, objectivity isn't really the, the right term anyway, because that's, that does seem like you're trying to obliterate your identity when your identity is your strength, right? And, you, and no one's gonna ignore it, least of all yourself. It tells you everything from what kind of stories you pursue, to who you talk to, to how you pursue them. So objectivity is not, some, it's not this holy grail for us to go after anyway. Um, to me, one of the things we should just sort of talk about more is in terms of fairness, which says Colton sort of refers to as fairness and balance, making sure you're getting other points of view out there where you may have blind spots. It's like being self-aware. Like I know, for example, that I am, uh, I was raised in a middle-class household and the workplace I've been in, I've been very few people who look like me. That's one of my biases. So I try to be aware of that. But at the same time, not doing that, I think the, the balancing act is on the false equivalency field. Balance does not mean equal. It does not mean equity. Um, when uh, Ida, Ida B. Wells, you know, when she wrote stories you know, her, had, uh, years ago, she didn't say like, well, lynching, some people really like lynching. So, you know, I make sure I get to hear from them. She, she, was, a, she was an activist and journalist and the old, sort of the old fashioned realm. So you want to do false equivalent. So you just want to be, to avoid blind spots. You try to be self-aware of what your biases might be, including against what you think you are, but what society has worked on you and you didn't even aware that you thought that way until all of a sudden you're in that and you're like, oh my goodness, I didn't know that I thought like that or I didn't know that I reacted or forgot that. So I think that's what you have to do is just be self-aware. And then again, talk to a lot of your colleagues and have lots of these discussions. I'll go quickly back to the beginning book, if you don't mind, Vanessa, when you asked about, uh, uh, this is a challenging time. I said, yes, it's a challenging time, but I will give my perspective. Like, at least I don't feel alone, like I did many years ago when I first got into the business. There's a lot more discussions, uh, people with different identities, people with uh, allies, not nearly enough and not nearly to discover. At least we are not letting it, letting it go or thinking that you are the only one that can speak up and say something or have to parse your words. So it's, to me, it's extremely challenging time. Always have been challenging times. It's sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's sometimes discouraging to see the same arguments, discussions and mistakes me media has now, we're going on 40 plus years ago. Very, that can be disheartening, but this seems to be a different time because people are taking action in different ways and people on this screen to more and more and more others. It's like the ripples in a pond. It's really making a difference. And that's where- Well, so I know I know you make a difference every day, Vanita. Try to. Awesome. Always, so we're, lucky but... to have, we're, we're lucky to have you on our side, but it's interesting, you know, and I don't want to seem like I'm, you know, Debbie Downer over here. I also want to make it very clear that while it is challenging times for journalism and communication and media, I wholeheartedly believe there is probably not a more critical time right now for what we do. Um, you know, Walter Cronkite himself said that journalism is what we need in order to make democracy work. That goes back to what you were saying, Nicole, about what Dean Gilgler shared at the beginning of that JMC 110 class. Lillian, I know you wanted to add something. Yes, I did. Um, just the thought about, you know, uh, we've had a big discussion about media outlets and, and, and bias blind spots or keeping objectivity. Um, and I just wanna like really hone in on the importance of educating yourself. Um, honestly, I believe as journalists or if you're in PR or if you're in long form, either way, um, I believe that the presentation of your product should be 10% of your actual job. Your job should be, the majority of it should be understanding what you're reporting, understanding um, both sides. For example, just yesterday, I was at um, a protest where um, there are there's a group of people who fly Confederate flags um, down here in in front of the Charleston Battery, and then a group of Black Lives Matter protesters that are on the other side of the street. And you know, you think about that. And I did we did a, I did a, a bunch of research into you know obviously I've done so much research into a lot of the um, 
the things that are going on right now in our world um, and, and why these protests are happening right now, especially with Black Lives Matter. Um, but then I also did my research on, okay, what's the context of why are these people flying flags? Well, they've been flying these, these Confederate flags outside of this Confederate monument for five plus years. That's been something that's been completely left out of coverage. And, and it, it not only adds to that story saying, hey, this is a continuous thing. Um, and if we think about objectivity, which objectivity is, it's a word that I wish we could just erase because at the end of the day, um, as a journalist, you should really truly strive to know absolutely as much as you can. You know, the historical context of the area, know even if, and I'm a day turn reporter, like I spend so much time researching in my day. And then by the end of the time I go live, I've done a lot of, a lot of the pre-research and to understand what is this group coming from? What is this group coming from? And I truly believe, you know, and this even ties in on the activism side, you know, if, if you're reporting something as, as controversial as certain things in our world right now, if you're armed with as much information as possible, things are much more, your story is much more deep and your story is much more impactful. Um, you want to make change, arm yourself with as much possible information as you can. Um, and, and I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate here, though, Lillian, because yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Clearly, to be, I always say to my students, as a journalist, you need to be informed yourself to inform your public. Yeah. But that should be something that comes with the territory in the sense that, right, it's part of our responsibility if we want to do our job well to make sure that we're informed. My question is, how do you how do you get the audience to understand that, right? In the sense of, you know, we see so much division, we see so much, we do see biased media media out there. It, it's out there. It exists along with a lot of misinformation and fake news. So my my perspective is always, you know, before you attack the press, why don't you look at different sources of news? Why don't, you know, inf try to inform yourself? And that's a message. How do you get that message across without sounding condescending, right? To, to your audience and to, the, to your clients. Um, I'm, I'm curious to pick your brains about that and see if you have any thoughts on, in, in that regard. Yeah. Um, so regarding that, I think that, you know, as members of the press, we do have the responsibility to give out people the information that we report on and stuff like that. But also we have to recognize that we're giving this information within the context that our public education system is failing. Um, folks don't have media literacy skills. People aren't informed on how it is that they can get multiple sources of, of news and it's readily disposed or like readily available for them in different media sites. And I think, you know, when you log on to Facebook, you see your uncle or your aunt putting out, you know, articles that are kind of iffy, but I think they don't know any better because I think the institutions that are meant to educate us have failed us as well. I think, you know, when I'm thinking back on my own experience, you know, I went to a middle school that was severely underfunded. I didn't have any science classes, um, you know, throughout my entire middle school. I think the highest science that I had ever taken until I got to high school, which was a college academic, like prep, was geology in third grade. So, you know, we have to understand that people are coming from different perspectives on this within the same stuff that we're reporting. You know, they're all reading the same words, but people have varying definitions of those particular words. And so, you know, I think it's, I think it's, the responsibility of the journalists who, yeah, you know, put things in historical context, but also understand that your audience themselves are, you know, participants in this larger conversation as well. Um, and I think, you know, we oftentimes forget that. And I think as our industry evolves, I think folks are gonna get reached at the place that they're at, you know? whether it's through words, through photos, through videography, through long form documentary like Nicole, you know, I think it's up to us to reach our audience where they are because otherwise we're just putting out content that nobody's reading, nobody's understanding. And what's the point about that, you know? And that's why, again, like I said, I think journalism is a tool. 
I think we have to put everything in context in the world that we're living on. You know, when people are reporting about Black Lives Matter protests, they have to contextualize that on the centuries of oppression that Black people have suffered and slavery. I think people aren't realizing that. And I think oftentimes, and this is circling back on the, the definition of what bias is and what like what being a good journalist is, I think you have varying definitions because people are coming at it from different experiences. Um, you can't expect a black woman to report exactly the same as a white man on a, on a topic that regards their own community. You know, like the, we can't be expecting that from people because that's not, that's not how our brain works. That's not how we actually experience life. You bring some interesting points up, Rafael. Colton, I'm, I'm curious to find out, um, because I'm, if I had to bet, I, I, I guess you get messages and emails and social media regarding the way you or your station covers particular topics. Do you ever engage with your viewers or your audience? Do you ever respond to the messages? If you do, how do you, how do you handle that? Well, yeah, it depends. Uh, sometimes people will come up to me and they'll say something like, you know, I don't understand why you guys are so hard on the precedent. Um, you know, all of you guys are, you know, just perpetuating some liberal agenda. And I take offense to that because we have a group of producers who go through the show line by line and we have two anchors for our show to find out the appropriate balance. Um, we, we strive so hard to do that um, because at the end of the day, you know, our credibility is on the line. You know, we're not a cable television news station. We are a, an NBC affiliate and we want to make sure that we're presenting, you know, as much balance as possible with our, with our news coverage. So if someone talks to me out in public, which does happen from time to time, that's, of course, I'm not going to like walk away and engage them. But um, sometimes when you like, we have, uh, for instance, in here in New Mexico, our governor had implemented some of the strictest um, uh, public health policies because of coronavirus. Uh, if you're visiting here in New Mexico, you have to quarantine for 14 days. If we leave New Mexico, we have to quarantine for 14 days. Wearing a mask is required in public everywhere, even if you're going for a run down the streets, otherwise you get a hundred dollar fine. And when we do stories like this and we post them on our Facebook pages, we'll get flooded with comments. And some of them are, you know, very, uh, what's the word? Um, like both extremes on both sides, you know, you get people calling these public health policies, uh, reminiscent of, of, uh, you know, of people have said, what, this is like a Nazi Germany with these, these public health orders being told that we have to do something. And then you have other people who are like, this is for our public health, this is for our, the safety of our communities, our families, our children. So you get both sides. And when it comes to those comments, Vanessa, I don't read them because they're just a lot to digest sometimes. And uh, even when if it's my um, people message me personally, yeah, I'll, I'll respond to them and kind of like tell them, well, this is what's going on. And here are both sides of the issue. And this is how we presented this. And uh, you can make your own decision with, with whatever, you know? So it, it's, it's tough. You can't please everybody. That's what I've noticed here. And uh, it, it's tough. It's tough, especially being someone who, uh, you know, is on the morning show and people, you know, people that, like invite us into their homes, you know, and that's such a privilege for them to do that to us. And, you know, sometimes they'll call us out for something that we want to defend, you know. I actually want to talk to that point. Um, specifically, like if you run into someone in person and they got questions or whatever, I think, you know, uh, this is again circling back to the idea that journalism is a tool. I think we have to reevaluate the, the purpose of a journalist and, and our role in our communities because I think that we are an asset to our communities, whatever communities we're reporting from, either it be, you know, a transplant and you're reporting in a whole different city or whatever, or you're reporting in your own community where you grew up. I think that you have to set, you know, you have to set friendships and relationships with the people that you're reporting on, because otherwise folks aren't going to trust you. You know, these are things that we learned growing up. You, you, you have relationships with people in order for people to understand where you're coming from. And if you're going to be, you know, producing news for people, you also have to know the people that you're reporting on. And, you know, it can be scary. 
if someone, you know, comes at you crazy at the grocery store talking about Nazi Germany and this being America, but at the same time, you have a grander responsibility there to try and help this person understand what's going on. You know, like I know that at some point, the 85714 zip code in my community was the highest COVID transmission rate in the state of Arizona. I know that because I saw it. And so because of that, I'm going to be out there giving out masks to people who are low income who can't afford them or can't get them, you know, because I know I've read studies that show that COVID might have more than just respiratory problems. I've seen that they've had neurological problems too. So because I'm informing myself on this issue, because I'm, I'm the person who is supposed to be the most informed in order to report on these things, I'm going to go out there and do what I have to do to make sure the people that I know I'm reporting on are safe. You know, like you have to put your job into context because otherwise, you know, people aren't going to trust you. And that's the whole problem that we're facing right now. People don't trust each other in order to to report on people. That's why if you if you've been out there reporting on the on the on the protests, you've seen cameramans like get their cameras busted down or like angled down in order for people to not get photos of themselves. We have to think about things in the bigger context of stuff. Some of our work is used by institutions that harm people as well. In the same way that we get harmed, people also get harmed too, you know? It's just like, we have to reevaluate our roles in our communities because otherwise we're perpetuating the same oppression or violence that we report on, you know? I love that, I love that. And I do really like the, um, uh, the thought of, <clears throat> sorry, of reaching the community. Um, it's something I'm trying to, I'm really working on here in South Carolina and Arizona, you know, I speak English and Spanish. And so it's been a beautiful blessing for me to be able to report on the Hispanic community in Arizona. But when I came here to South Carolina, I'm like, I'm st I'm a year in you guys. I'm still trying to figure out, okay, how do I reach the Hispanic community? Because you know what? South Carolina is a hot spot for COVID-19 right, right now. Um, and the more and more I speak with people in the community and I've gone and I've, I've made sure to call some of the the big or the Hispanic organizations here and I've called and I've talked to their their um, directors and they're like information we just need information and so for one of the stories that I did in my tag you know look the 90% of the people who speak only speak English down here had would had no idea what I said um, you know but for that for the 20,000 or plus Hispanics here in in the low country you know half of my tag said explain to them if you need more information on COVID-19 go to my website, go to our website. And at the bottom, you will find all of the information you need. And so at the bottom, I did a, a Spanish section, like use what you have, what you know, um, to reach that community that is marginalized or needs, um, needs to be reached. Um, so like, I'm all about that. I feel like for many journalists, and, and please feel free to jump in, it's, it's sort of this constant battle right now between you know, reporting on the communities that we cover, making sure that we're doing as best a job as possible, that we're being as objective as we can. But at the same time, it's is it our responsibility to educate all of the audience, right? I mean, so I, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are, uh, are, are on that. Um, I know that I used to always struggle with, it's part of my job. It's part of my job to educate the community. But then I would have days where I would say, I can't do this anymore. It's not my job anymore to educate you. You should educate yourself. So that's why I say it's a constant battle. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, my opinion on that, my friend and I this summer started a YouTube channel like for the purpose of educating people on social justice issues. And like a lot of the comments that we've gotten were just like kind of ignorant and like the weight of how come you don't understand this just like kind of sits on me. And I feel like that's very similar also in the news, like you feel like if I don't explain everything to you and then you you develop this information and use it in a negative aspect, is that my fault because I didn't educate you all the way through? So in my opinion, I think that we sit more so as like to get the gears grinding in their head. Like you need to start thinking about this. And like in investigative journalism, there's sometimes like at the end of a documentary, like they'll either have all their resources listed or there's some form of like a call to action at the end. Like my sophomore year of high school, I did a documentary um, on human trafficking, which is unfortunately a huge problem in the Austin metropolitan area. So at the end, I was like, if you would like to get involved and help, 
there's all of these different organizations, there's all of these different resources and urging people like to continue to do your own research. It's not entirely the job, I would say, of the media or the press or that respective journalist in that community to hold all of that on your shoulders. Your job is to get as much information out there because if you're telling people what to think, you're telling people this is the information you need to learn, and you're kind of defeating the purpose of this being a democratic institution. You're getting them in the right direction so that they can develop their own thoughts and make their own decisions from that point. Definitely. I think also, you know, with that, we're not alone in this, you know, we have other people who are also writing. And I think even bigger than that, outside of journalism, we have people who are organizing and who are also trying to give people the information they need on stuff. I think, you know, for us Gen Zers, we have peers who are actively organizing right now. You know, we have folks who have been organizing since high, since high school. And I think it's hard to think about how it is that we're gonna be doing things all on our own, but we can't forget that there are other people involved in this too. I think this goes back to the whole issue of self-care. I think, you know, we do have to step up and step back. Um, I think, you know, especially for folks who come from disenfranchised backgrounds, you know, I can't expect a black woman to re-educate me every single time on a particular subject regarding her experience when Google's available. You know, like we exist in a time where everything is so easily accessible through Google, through multiple different outlets that are available to us 24 seven digitally, you know? And I think, again, recontextualizing everything, not everybody has that access, but it's becoming more and more accessible every single day, you know? And I think if we really start to work together and creating change, because I think at the end of the day, journalism as a tool is what it's meant to do. You know, shout out Ida B. Wells, because that's what she did. Um, I think we just have to work together with other people because otherwise we're just gonna stress ourselves out and not do anything. So I wanna, before we continue, I wanna make sure I, I read one of the questions that our audience member uh, members are posing. So this one is from, well, it doesn't have a name, but it says, what do you think about writing inflammatory articles under a pen name while remaining objective as a journalist? Famously, Alexander Hamilton under Americanus and Benjamin Franklin as Silence Do Good. And I know, Vanita, you answered that in the chat, but I don't think our audience gets a chance to see that. So I wanted to read your answer out loud. And it said, I believe you should stand behind your work using your own identity and your own name. It adds to credibility and authenticity. I would absolutely 100% wholeheartedly agree with that. Sorry, I don't mean to keep jumping in, but I think that this is exactly like that issue of not having transparency is another issue that we have going on in our industry. And I think, you know, when we live in a time where you can create a fake account in two seconds, it becomes even easier to do that. You know, we always have some sort of bot leaving comments on, on articles that we write, on Instagram posts that we put out. and. That is just like the, the 21st century version of what Alexander Hamilton did in that day, you know? And I think we have to be transparent with our audiences because otherwise this, this whole thing about building trust really comes down to having that connection with your audience, that reader, that, that person who writes the letters to the editor, the person who always comments on your Instagram pictures and stuff like that. You have to go outside of your journalism persona and talk to this person as a real person. You know, you have to make these relationships. I, I you know what, yeah. I, I totally agree. And I think that's, you know, if we can offer more transparency into the process for the readers and the viewers to, to see how, as they say, the sausage gets made, I actually think that can only help our cause in the sense of saying, look, this is how we do it. This is why we made these choices. This is why we made these decisions. Um, so I absolutely agree and think that the more transparency we offer as journalists, I think the more of a favor we're doing to ourselves in the sense of our, of our cause and making sure that people understand where we're coming from, from a journalistic perspective. Colton, I wanted to segue to you and circle back with what you said earlier in the session regarding your commitment to um, reporting and covering Native American issues, specifically because I'm um, it's true, unfortunately, we don't have a huge number of Native American journalists out right now working in the field. And so I just think this is such an important topic 
Do you mind sharing with us a little bit about what are some of those efforts or what is it that you actually, do you just try to keep in mind every day as you straddle that line between being a journalist, but at the same time being Native American and wanting to give a voice to your community? Absolutely. And uh, one of the things I want to say really quickly is I saw that Indian Country Today is located at Cronkite now, and there's been so much being done with the coverage of Native America, with uh, the students, and also hiring people to actually report those stories. And, you know, it's, it's a challenge, because uh, when you think about it, um, when you're talking about educating others, sometimes I think, I mean, I have to try to, you know, like when it comes to uh, the number of tribes, for instance, there are 570 federally recognized Native American tribes, but most people don't know that. Uh, there are even more that are state recognized. Uh, in Arizona, I believe there are 26 tribes. Uh, here in New Mexico, there are 24 pueblos, bands, and tribes as well. And the Navajo Nation, you know, expands three different states. And when people find out that I'm Native American, number one, they have a whole bunch of questions, you know, they, they want to ask me about, um, you know, how, how my upbringing was, um, how do you, is, is how really the way you say hello in Native American, when we all have our own tribal cultures, we have our own stories, we have our own uh, governments, uh, people don't seem to understand that. So I do find myself in the position that I'm constantly having to, to educate others because, when I look around, I don't really see, at least, you know, in the local media level at this point, um, doing that. Yeah, there are many documentaries, there are many books out there, there are many podcasts that you can listen to, but people don't search out for those, you know, if it doesn't align with their interests. And I think to understand American history, you have to understand Native American history, because when we talk about the, uh, you know, the founding of, of our of our country here there were upwards of 20 million people here before European colonization. And when it comes to our textbooks within like middle school or even high school, manifest destiny and assimilation are uh, taught and not to the, uh, the broken treaties or the, the mass murdering of indigenous people. So these are things that people don't understand because you know, maybe there's not a reservation near where they are or the, it's just too complex because it really can become a lot to uh, unpack when you talk about it. So uh, it's being objective with these stories, finding the stories, also finding stories that, um, you know, do away with harmful stereotypes. Uh, there's a lot of those when it comes to Native America, um, the drunk Indian, for instance, or, or the chief mentality. And I try to find stories that show, hey, we have this Navajo doctor who is on the front lines of uh, coronavirus, or we have uh, you know, this Native American educator who is using this time to promote uh, indigenous perspective education with online learning for students in New Mexico. So these are stories that, you know, I, I'm so lucky that I have the, 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 the connection and the knowledge to, to get it out there because these are the stories that for me get the highest uh, shares, likes, views, and uh, comments. You know, you'll have some ignorant people making certain statements, but at the same time, you know, these are stories that are getting out there that are being told for people whose voices have been not heard for a long time. Thank you, Colton. It's important work. So, Vanita, you have one more point you'd like to add? Oh, you in the Zoom world, you're muted. I am muted in the Zoom world. Sorry about that. That was myself. I just wanted to add onto the transparency because I still think it's important. But I think we also need to recognize that it takes courage sometimes because, you know, if you don't have an organization that backs you up or if you're LGBTQ or you're a woman or a person of color, you're at higher risk of being like either doxxed or disparaged on social media. So just recognizing that too, transparency puts some people at risk and we need to recognize that. I'm still saying we should do it, just we got a way to do it safely in a way, or at least with some backup. As safely as possible. Absolutely. That's an important point. So before we wrap up, I'd like to ask every single one of the panelists one last question. And that is, let's say you meet someone for the very first time 
and you are trying to explain to that person what you do and why you do it. How would you go about that? I would say I am a journalist for a TV station here in Albuquerque. We broadcast all over New Mexico. Um, I do the newscasts in the morning and I try to find the good in people every day uh, because there is a lot of good out there. Yeah, there's doom and gloom, but I wanna make sure that the, the good positive stories are also being highlighted. Also, I wanna make sure that people are held accountable for things. Um, there are a lot of things that happen and a lot of things people say they're gonna do, but then they don't do it. So, you know, holding them accountable is, is what I like to do and what I do. I think I would say that my work is, you know, me being a storyteller and actively trying to search for voices who have been suppressed and, and put at the margins of our society in order to give a better understanding of the world that we exist in. Excellent. Mary, Lily, and Nicole. Benita? All right, I'll pop in. Um, so, you know, someone walks up to me and says, well, what do you do? Well, I'm a reporter, um, but much more than a reporter. Um, I'm somebody who wants to document history as it's happening, um, and I want to do it thoroughly. Um, and just, you know, um, I want to be a person that is armed with my information, but also is someone that does actively seek out the voices um, and the stories and um, the, the people and the places that you won't, you wouldn't be able to go, um, or or people don't know about, um, because some of the most rich stories come out of the things that are unknown, um, and I feel like that is a part of my job and a reason why I do do it is to uncover things, the good, the bad, the ugly, um, and to make change through the through my storytelling. Um, I'd say that I'm a public relations specialist and an overall storyteller, and that I the reason that I do what I do is to kind of bring the media to stories that they might oversee without the help of PR or the help of pushing um, those storylines. Um, I think that at the end of the day, it kind of helps just diversify our news media. Thank you, Mary. I mean, everyone kind of summed up what I would say probably, but um, hopefully in the future, I'll be an investigative reporter. Um, I'm someone who likes to take the time to not only find the stories that don't get told, but listen to the people who are not used to being listened to um, and make sure that people have access to that story and that that story causes a catalyst for change, not something that you watch and you turn off after an hour and you're like, oh, that was cool, but you don't do anything else. It pushes you to want to be better. It pushes you to want to make the world that you live in better for not only yourself, but the other people that you live right next to or that you, you exist alongside with. I thought. That's an excellent question. I would say that I am, I would describe myself as a journalist and a professor and an inclusionist. And as such that I like to tell stories that matter and to teach others to tell stories that matter. And, and I like that. Very nice. Inclusionist. Never heard that term before. There's always a first time. Well, with that, I'd like to once again thank our panel. I'm going down the rows here. Mary, Colton, Vanita, Rafael, Lillian, and Nicole. Thank you so much for spending uh, an hour and 15 minutes of your day with us, um, of sharing of your experiences, of your perspectives, your expertise. Um, this was, quite frankly, a very authentic, I think, conversation. And we touched on a lot of really important topics. And like I said at the beginning, hopefully this won't be the, the, the first or the last of these kinds of partnerships between the Cronkite School and Barrett Honors. So thank you all once again for joining us and thank you to our audience for tuning in. We hope you have a wonderful afternoon and thanks everybody once again. Thank all of you. I learned so much.